Welcome to Module 4, Social Media and Sports. Because social media is a very vast topic, I've chosen to focus on three things that you should know about social media and sports and target them and focus them on the, for the PR and advertising professional. In the reading, Galen Clavio de uh, delineated three categories of social media rather than focusing on one application specific uh, for use. He focused on data-rich sites, which are used better on a desktop than on mobile, and these include things like Facebook, ESPN, or LinkedIn. These are typically or often static pages uh, with very little updates um, and can contain a lot of rich information on them. Next, we have our streamlined type of media. Um, the way that these are categorized, obviously, these are going to be your Twitter, these are going to be your Instagram. And these focus on the speed of transmission rather than the breadth of content. And they rely on quick social engagement that is very sequential in nature. So likes, reposts, retweets, um, a lot of scrolls. And obviously th these are tools that you guys are probably more used to uh, working with being Twitter and Instagram. And then last and probably the largest uh, growth potential would be your locational services. And you'll notice, in, um, as we'll talk a little bit in the uh, er, later read, uh, presentation, Levi Stadium, for example, is starting to make good use of this locational uh, ability of these uh, apps. These are ones that are GPA, GPS focused and ask people to check in and it is a way to give them back some sort of reward for checking in. It's also important to note that aside from the applications that we've covered, um, the services, uh, it's important to understand the services that are provided to the target the fan. Now there are two ways that you can approach the fan. You can approach the fans in the stands or you can approach those at home. As previously mentioned, Levi Stadium in San Francisco uh, does a really good job of being a smart stadium. They target the fans in the stadium, they allow users to get online, use locational things to check in, and they can actually order pizza and beer and everything from their seats. They can get information, they can access information uh, that are unique for the fan being in the stadium, in the fa uh, seats. And they also encourage them to interact with the media, players, and other people since they do have this great view of what's happening there at the stadium. Also, it's important to realize, as we've said before, 45% of fans are using a second screen while consuming sport. So it's important that there's a way that you can market to these people or acknowledge them and get them involved and engaged even though they're not the stadium. So what today I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about three different ways that brands should use and can use social media to engage with fans. And as I mentioned, there are several approaches we can take with social media, but for this course I'm going to focus on streamlined services serving primarily fans at home. And I'm also going to take this from the brand of a perspective, the perspective of a brand rather than a sport organization. Um, this should help sort of frame and guide this lecture and hopefully give you guys something that if you work in an agency and they ask or if you want to have an opportunity to work on social media with a, for a brand and engage in a sport and event, this will hopefully give you some sort of leverage or some sort of ways to help guide the discussion and making you an effective member of your team. I always like to frame this discussion as the Super Bowl party analogy. Um, we've all hosted or maybe we've been to a Super Bowl party where an uninvited guest is brought maybe as a tag along, a plus one, or just sometimes just shows up. Now there are always one of two things that happen. Either one, everyone really loves this uninvited guest because he adds to the conversation, makes some jokes, he even brings something to the party and adds a little bit of value. Or we hate the guy because he interrupted double dips and only wants to talk about himself. So, it's important to remember that as the brand, you are the uninvited guest on someone's newsfeed. Uh, and as I previously said, this lecture applies predominantly to streamlined media for fans at home. What are some tactics and uh, strategies that you can use to make sure that if you're, as you're interacting with these fans, highly identified fans on their news feeds, uh, through Twitter, Instagram, that your brand can stick out and see success rather than being um, seem disingenuous and have a negative repercussions as a result. So number one, it's important to have a strategy and be proactive. If you want to work in sports or you want to get your brand involved in sports, that's great, but you can't just show up on the day of the event and expect to have some sort of payback from it. You need to know what you're getting into. That means number one, you have to study the insights of the fans. What is it that they like? What do they dislike? What are their rituals? What are their traditions? What are some of the sayings, the slogans, the songs? What makes this fan base unique? As I said, highly identified fans have a group behavior, and it's important that you understand those insights. 
Also, if you're going to show up to a sporting event as a brand, you need to know about the sport. What are the rules? How does it work? Who are the teams? What are the rivalries? There's a lot of, a lot of questions that you need to consider and know everything and be an expert in that content and that sport. Uh, or the same goes for the event. And then lastly, you need to understand the teams. Uh, if you're going to be talking on behalf of the organization of a, of, of a brand and you're trying to appeal to these fans, you need to make sure that some way, once again, you articulate your relationship to that team and find some sort of commonality so that the fans will buy into this and hopefully share and participate in this conversation. So let me give you an example of being uh, proactive and having a strategy. In the 2014 World Cup, uh, the Adidas successfully used the All-In campaign. They had 1.7 million mentions, which is 22% more than any other brand. And they didn't happen, this didn't happen by accident. Months prior to the Cup, they created an editorial calendar that covered every possible fixture and opportunity that they could talk about. That identified the top players, possible scenarios, and they even started to understand the rituals and the um, habits of these fans for these different countries. And what they did is, as a result, they were able to create content uh, ahead of time and then be the first to market or be the first on the social media thing to go ahead and present this uh, conversation. So, for example, um, James Rodriguez, um, he played the World Cup. He was a golden boot uh, contender, meaning he you know, had scored uh, more goals than anyone else if you're not a soccer fan. Um, and he was a kind of a star player, or he emerged from the World Cup as sort of a, a star athlete. Well, Adidas knew that he was already an athlete before, or a star, a potential star, before the World Cup even happened. So they were able to have content ready that was able to speak to the fans of the, uh, that country and really identify with them. And as a result, you can see the number of retweets and favorites they got off this one tweet. They also made good use of being involved in the sport or the event, and they gave the, uh, the official game ball his own sort of Twitter handle, and they had someone working with that. Uh, and it was great because this involved the fans, it gave the brand personality, and it was able to allow them to have this natural sort of organic conversation. It didn't seem like it was selling you something, but rather it was a character or a spokesperson of the brand, if you will, that was really identifying and engaging with the fans. Which leads me to my next point. You need to know the rules of the game, know the fans wants the rituals, and know it's appropriate to speak up. So number two, pra uh, practice anticipatory thinking and be ready to be reactive. So just as important as to have a strategy to be proactive, you and your company need to be able to be reactive. If you already have a strategy in place, you already have the insights on the event, the teams, and the fans, then you can take, uh, take opportunities to engage with the fans, making shareable and timely content. If you remember, Oreo sort of set the Twitter uh, world on fire with their Super Bowl tweet. This was one of the first things that got a lot of traction because it was the first time a lot of people saw how Oreo, when the lights went out and um, during the Super Bowl, they had this really kind of funny ingest tweet that came out. A lot of people got uh, a lot of traction and still talk about it today. And you've seen this sort of develop more and more commonly. For example, Snickers, using the World Cup again as a uh, context for this, uh, Suarez, a uh, uh, forward from Uruguay, bit another player on the shoulder. Snickers used this opportunity during the game to make, send out this tweet that said, hey, Suarez, next time you're hungry, just grab a Snickers. Um, and again, you can see that got 46,000 retweets, 20,000, approximately 21,000 likes. This got more attraction than a $1 million commercial spot would have got. And again, it was understanding who these players are, understanding what's happening, and then having quick abilities to release content. And then here's another one that didn't get as much traction, but still is a great example. Um, during the Ohio State, uh, I'm sorry, during the Oregon uh, versus Florida State um, no, I'm sorry, yeah, Oregon versus Ohio State, uh, when Ohio State kept repeatedly turning over the ball. Um, Butterfinger sent out this tweet, seriously, what's this ball made of tonight? Um, again, just sort of using their brand and speaking to the fans. So when you take from all of these, it's important you can kind of boil down these examples into a few things. Number one, there's obviously a high risk and a high reward. You can get an opportunity to get a lot of likes and a lot of retweets. There's also the negative or the possibility of getting negative PR. 
But what it's the most important is to understand is to, you need to be one of the fans in the room and speak from their perspective. Brand managers, you need to be willing to uncuff creative so you can be the first to message. And also you need to take two seconds to think about what to post, make sure it's witty, but make sure it's also appropriate. And it's really important to have the right people in the room. Ad agencies and brands, or if you're working for an agency, maybe this should be something that you can recommend if they're not already doing it. But having a copywriter, an art director, an account manager, and a decision maker for the brand in the room at the same time during the event. So as something comes up, not only can you write it, but you can also make it look good and produce a, a graphic that's sort of easily to shareable and visually appealing. Um, with these, it's also important that you stick to your brand's message and identity. So Snickers, it's always talks about, you know, you're not you and you're hungry. So finding a way that you can use your brand to fit in seamlessly in this conversation and make a joke about the uh, event or the happening and still support your brand is a challenge, but it's just something that's very necessary. And lastly, it's important that you understand when to talk to the fans and when to engage, for them, engage with them. As I've mentioned so many times now, 45% of highly identified fans are using a second screen. And research shows that before and after halftime are the spikes. So if you're a brand and you're trying to get your message out, number one, you may want to have some content ready to be shared or sent out right before a break and a halftime or right after halftime. Also, you need to have those opportunistic spikes during break and play ready. Um, if the lights go out, Ohio State or Oreo is ready to show their graphics. Um, what's really important to do and understand is that only 6% are still engaged after the game. So if you're trying to work for a brand and you're trying to speak to fans after the game, you're probably not going to get the type of traction. Although it seems like a lot of people are on tw uh, social media to get re game results, um, the large bulk, or the large majority are not. They're out celebrating, talking about with their fans, or they've tuned out and went to the next game. And also when you're talking to the fans and how to talk to the fans, it's really important to talk about things that the fan base enjoys. Um, recall, if you recall, highly identified fans and group behavior are very predictable. So if you are talking to a group of fans and you know that their insights say that they like good old American um, domestic Miller Lite beer, then don't come up talking about how great your craft beer is. Um, you need to be authentic with who you are. Bring what the people at the party are going to want to have. Uh, so you can then be part of the discussion. So this concludes this module. I know it's very brief. Um, again, we're trying to focus all these different ways we can talk about social media. And I think working in an organization, if you're working for a brand, you can follow these three simple guidelines and see some success or some traction. Again, you want to be proactive and have a strategy in place. You want to practice anticipatory thinking and be reactive. And you need to know when and to how to talk to the fans. And all this is going to be developed through insights. So never discount the importance of research, uh, insights of the fans, the sporting event, and the brand itself.